Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. Welcome back everyone to Talk Dizzy to Me. My name is Dr. Abby Ross. I'm a vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist joined today as always by Dr. Danny Tolman. She's also a vestibular physical therapist. And today we have a guest from Vestibular First. His name is Patrick Esmond. He's going to talk to us all about the model that he's created in conjunction with Vestibular Today and kind of its progression from the early days and his background to where we're at now and why it's important for you as a clinician or even you as a patient, if you wish, to have this in your clinic. So Patrick, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you here because we both kind of started on this whole 3D printed model um, journey around the same time, but uh, did not have our, our paths uh, merged together for a long time. And I'm really, really excited to be working with you guys now. You've just taken this product to a whole new level, but I'm really, really excited to get more into the history of it and the whole evolution of um, the 3D printing project, what you've done with your uh, with Helena, your wife and business partner, and kind of see you know where this whole world of 3D printing and clinical education is going. So um, let's start from the beginning. First, give us a little bit of a background on yourself and we'll go from there. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I am not a vestibular clinician. Um, the My background is mainly around um, technology and business. So I have a very strong um, uh, kind of tinkering. I was always building things as a kid, taking things apart, learning how they worked. Um, around that time or kind of growing up, I also got into pottery and art. And that's also an influence that we'll see kind of later in some of these modeling. Um, but yeah, I um, mainly IT consulting and a little bit of kind of support side of uh, higher education, but um, not a vestibular clinician. Um, but I will, I think, uh, Danielle, you you gave me the honorary vestibuloholic award, and <laughs> which I humbly accept because I really am, oops, I really am just totally fascinated by the vestibular system. Um, it's something that I have really grown to appreciate as we started our company. Um, and actually the models were something that I, I kind of did for myself because as I was trying to understand some of the, the anatomy of how the system worked, um, I was presented with limited options uh, in, <laughs> that were available. So um, in some ways, some of the, the models that we developed were really to teach myself, a non-clinician, like how it all worked and uh, you know why the physics of it worked. Um, I really want to understand kind of from the root, you know, the root physics and the root motion, what causes those, uh, you know, those, um, those reactions or the, the normal reactions and also then what would cause abnormal reactions. So it's just really, really fascinating. Well, it's such an abstract concept. I remember when we were learning this in neuro and PT school, um, our teacher in lab whipped out pipe cleaners and beads and had us whip together. Yep, exactly. If you guys something are something like this, perhaps exactly <laughs> like that. Uh, if you guys are listening to the podcast, uh, Patrick is holding up a perfect representation of exactly what I'm talking about. Which you'll see, we saw a lot in um, weekend continuing ed classes. We saw it in PT school. But the idea was that you would fasten these uh, pipe cleaners together and have a bead on each pipe cleaner to simulate each canal and the movement of these crystals. But you look at that and you're like, how the heck? Does this right. work? Like, how does it position in your head? Right. This doesn't make any sense to me. And once I started to specialize and I went through my clinical rotation and I was starting a job in Maryland, I was going with my um, coworkers to a con ed class. And I thought the best way for them to really visualize what we were learning was through a model. So I use a uh, modeling clay. I think it was Crayola modeling clay to, to attempt to make something a little bit more 3D, which was horrible, um, but it got the job done. And then, like you said, being able to visualize and kind of wrap your head around an actual model is extremely helpful, but it was rare to find. A lot of the models that they had available for purchase were artist renditions, 
which is great to be able to picture what it is, but it wasn't exact to the angles and how it was positioned in the head, which is, as you know, and, and found out over time, very yeah. important for treatment. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into the progression of the model, we know you're a businessman. We know you like to build and you have, you know, the background in technology. How come vestibular? Yeah, so that's a great little story, um, which I love telling because uh, it involves my lovely wife, Helena, um, who, as you know, is a vestibular cl clinician. And essentially, our family was growing, and we were at a point where we wanted someone home when the kids got home. At that point in time, my job really wasn't flexible enough. Um, so Helena was like, well, let me see if my job will let me kind of get the school hours. And as it turns out, the answer was no. <laughs> so she started looking essentially for a clinic that uh, would give her the hours that she wanted. She did find a clinic that was just right, of, right up the street from us, but they couldn't afford uh, goggles the infrared video goggles. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a showstopper for her because she understood at that point that treating without goggles is, you know, it's educated guessing and it, it just, it's not the full picture. It's we, the analogy I use for non-clinicians is like, it's like a cardiologist not having a stethoscope. Like, yes. Could they put their chest to your, uh, your, their ear to your chest or could they feel your pulse? Sure. But they're not getting the full spectrum um, of information to make the correct diagnosis. So she basically came to me and said, I really love this job. I love this clinic, but I don't have goggles. So she asked me if I could build her goggles. And I, I, I said, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've never built infrared video goggles. So I approached it similar to an IT consulting client is that, I kind of looked at the inputs, I looked at the outputs, I looked at the kind of the technology in between the two and was able to build a very, very rough prototype um, with about four hours of time and some Amazon parts. And she woke up the next day and I had kind of a, a very rough, it was still cardboard and string, um, but I had eyes on a screen. I had eyes, infrared, you know, cameras pointed in an eye in a, in a VR goggle that I hacked all apart. And that's kind of how it started. She did one little post online, like, hey, I, my husband built me goggles. <laughs> and before long, we had people sending us money. Like, we didn't have a company. We didn't have a website. We didn't even know our name. And people were mailing us, like, checks to build them goggles. So we were like, okay, like, hold on. <laughs> we can't just start a medical device company. Like we have to go through this a little bit more methodically. So husband I did take of the, of yeah, the, husband yeah. of the year award to any vestibular holic out there. I, I mean, that is absolutely amazing. I have received two marriage proposals um, <laughs> on the trade show floor. Um, Helena was right there. So everything was above board, but yes, one person specifically is like, I have been asking my husband to build me these for like 10 years. And he said it wasn't possible. So I, I may have gotten him in trouble when she got home that <laughs> from that conference. I don't know. <laughs> You're setting the standard quite high, Patrick. <laughs> I, I will say what I love, uh, what I love about physical therapists is just how enterprising and like resourceful you are and i actually would love to see a program where you pair an engineer and a vestibular and, and a therapist together because some of the things i see are just brilliant um and you really just need someone who can take your ideas and put put some engineering around it put some structure around it um but yeah i would i get a lot of ideas just from talking to clinicians and they're like oh i really wish i had something that did x and it's not, some of those aren't even that hard. It's just a matter of, you, yeah, you do have to understand material properties and maybe some 3D design. Like there's some basics you need that just, you know, PTs are very focused on patient care and that's great. Um, but there's not as, there's probably not as much time to, to do all the other stuff that's involved in getting a product off the ground. Yeah, I mean, you're right. When I was looking into these models, it's when I came across the NIH 3D Print Exchange Program, and they had the actual 
file of a patient scanned vestibular apparatus. But it was really rough and it had all this junky nerve bundle stuff on the back of it. And I have no clue about anything when it comes to software or 3D modeling. So I had to pair up with somebody that I actually went to high school with that started a company who was right. able to help me. Whereas Helena had somebody right in her own house. Right. I mean, she, had some, like, she had somebody that could kind of sit down and actually work with her in the same room and start to figure this stuff out. So what was the next step? You guys are working on these goggles, which we have spoken about many, many times in our podcast, just because um, we do love them. And they're great uh, resource for clinicians at a great price point. Um, so your, yours always kind of rises to the top with our recommendations. But from I there, you also developed these educational models. Yes. Um, so tell us where that kind of get, got started and how you kind of got into that. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So um, it actually did start with the exact model that you're talking about. So this model is the actual model that Helena came home from a, a course from, and we had already started our we had already started in goggles. I was kind of building my my scientific repertoire of like knowledge and was and was very frustrated with what what was available. So she came home with this, and I was like, you know, like Aristotle has been was writing about vertigo, and this is as far as we've come. Like those are the pipe cleaners for anybody listening to the podcast. Correct. These are the yeah. pipe cleaner model, and I'm like, there's like. Okay, I'm, I, I certainly am not like a sculptor, but I know enough about form and function that we can get something started. So what I basically did is I looked for existing resources. So I found the NIH model, and there's another model out of Australia. Now that was like a very, I would that was not uh, totally anatomically accurate, which is something that you and I have talked about before, how there is there's images and videos out there that are just wrong about the mm -hmm. vestibular system. So as someone trying to learn about it, it was very frustrating to see like the cupula wrong. And there was like fluid going over and around the cupula. Like, and so that was, that was certainly a process I had to go through. Um, but essentially what ended up being our very first model is this one, which is a very simple, solid 3D model. Now, in our case, um, I wanted this to sit on a table. So I actually have, I, I tried to find photos of this, but I printed out like 50, like maybe inch sized models of this, but just angled slightly different. And I sat them on my desk and I would just kind of flick them <laughs> as, from all different directions, I'd twist it and flip it, twist it and flip it. And just see kind of which one stayed on the desk the most, um, you know, kind of not zero times because um, it still is pretty top heavy, um, mm -hmm. but enough to make it kind of a desktop model that would really just focus on the vestibular system or the, the, the bony labyrinth, essentially. Um, so this is our first solid model. Um, and that was, again, it was, a, it was a, a based on those two different models that I brought into a software called Blender. Okay. And I'm actually going to show you that software kind of uh, live on how I did some of these other models. Um, something else that I also found, and this is not um, nothing against the industry, but there's a there's kind of a fine line between art and science. And I feel like it was all science. Like everything was very accurate, very this, all the noise of the fibers and the, you know, all of the roughness. And that's fine. From, a, from that standpoint, but I also wanted to make it beautiful. Like I really wanted to accentuate all of the really, the kind of natural curves. So in this model in particular, I went through every intersection in the 3D software and I made sure that like this blended nice and smooth and that line was nice. And that's, you know, I wanted to make sure the ampulla, all the ampullas really like stood out. So that way, even though it, is it is this like from an actual person? No. But does it really highlight the important areas like the ampullas? Yes, it does. And I made sure that not only it did that, but it also it would look really nice on someone's desk. Um, so that's that's another aspect I, I think I brought from my pottery experiences, you know, smoothing out the curves, making the, you know, the base nice and stable so it doesn't tip over like you would do with a, if you're throwing a bowl, you don't want a, a foot that's too small. You want to make sure it's just wide enough so the bowl won't tip over during a normal use. So then two things, in what year did you start on your venture with models? And then what came after this initial 
Yeah, so the first model, I went, I had to go back into my photos to look at the timestamp, um, but it was 2018 was this first model. Um, and that was done um, just with Blender in my own software. At that point, we had 3D, we had some uh, 3D printers. So we were able to make these models in house. Um, and that also let me do the, the rapid prototyping. So the 50 little ones, and I, I would print them one after another. So I'd print one, test it. Oh, all right, tint it this way, print it, slice it. So if you tried to do that with an external service, not only would it be very expensive, um, but you're waiting two weeks between every variation. Um, and that would be, that would, it really takes it uh, just too long to, to make that effective. I can attest to that. That and every yeah. time you have to make a change, your yeah. um, 3D designer, you know, charges you your designing fee. So right. for me, like I, I, this was just something that I was doing out of pocket for like a passion project. I never in a million years thought about selling them. And I was working with, you know, with uh, 3D Brooklyn and they're absolutely amazing. But again, like right. I couldn't sit there and pay them for every little adjustment. So any, any little thing that kind of came right. about, you know, was good enough for that rendition. I completely get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then to answer your other question, Abby, um, so the, the, the real goal I was trying to solve um, was the crystals. Um, in my head, the, and this is where the technology just is not there yet, I would love to have a full model that shows the saccule, utricle, the, the, the entire vestibule area, all the canals and how they connect and have it be fluid and have them be able to get stuck on the both sides of the cupola. But the technology is just not there yet to make that kind of model. So I had to kind of take some baby steps. Um, so what that led to was our fluid model, which is what I'm showing here. So this is the same base as this as the original solid model. But I what I did is I lopped off different sections and I found tubing um, that would hold mineral oil and would hold the stones. Uh, and we worked a very long time even just to get those stones correct. And I don't know if the, I can pull up a video of it later, but the idea here is that we went through about 12 different fluids and a same number of little stones to get the fall rate, like nearly perfect. Um, it will take between 30 seconds and a minute which is what I have been told by experts is about how long you hold until you start seeing the nystagmus um, die down. But until you get to that next position, those are hanging out until you're ready to go. Some other aspects um, that were important to me, again, as I'm teaching myself, was that like the ampulla side where the cupula is, I wanted the crystals to stop there. I wanted them to actually pile up to show that's where the cupula was. Like, that they do not pass here. They actually, they, they stay here. Whereas once you clear it on this side, we, we basically in the model, we push that down really, really low. So it appears as though the crystals on this, when they actually go on the, the vestibule side, they disappear. So, and that was again, important to me to understand like, all right, at the ampulla, which is where the cupula is, those crystals, they stop there. They, they can't pass. Um, but then once they clear it, so kind of like a perfect model, you wouldn't see any crystals, right? Like there shouldn't be any crystals normally in those canals. Um, so that was like also really important to me that some of the anatomy and some of the the functions of the anatomy were were demonstrated in the model as well. I love all that attention to detail because somebody looking at the model might not have taken that into consideration. It's not until you start playing around with it that you really start to see all the little nuances on how accurate that is. And who there's a couple of different people you guys consulted with to help um, create this model. So who are uh, name drops some of those clinicians that sure. have a hand in all of this? Sure. I think that's impressive too. Yeah, so we actually met at the International Vestibular Conference in Chicago, which is where I met you for the first time. Um, we met Dr. Dominic Oberist. Uh, he's an international, re he's a researcher, and he specifically studies the fluid dynamics of the inner ear. And who knew that I'd be able to find someone who just studied just the fluid? Um, and then out of Chicago is Dr. Timothy Hain. Mm -hmm. um, he runs a pretty big site. He has a very extensive website of videos and educational. Um, but he was very particular. When we had reached out to him about the goggles, 
he had kind of mentioned on the side his frustration with edu patient education. So he had some ones that he had built uh, similar to how John Epley had done it with buckets and tubes, um, but was not very visually appealing. He didn't have functional cupulas. Like there is just limitations to his approach. Um, so, and, and he's a researcher as well. So um, with a lot of YouTube videos, um, I, I have the tubes somewhere. I tried to find them, but we have like, water and a stone we have rubbing alcohol and tiny crystals we had you know we went through pretty much every combination and we would take a video of the stones falling and time it and just over the internet we were able to figure out like you know like what was just the right balance of that one thing i love about the fluid model is that uh, vestibular dysfunction or disorders in general are invisible illnesses. So yeah. if someone is to tell someone else that they have otoconia or crystals <laughs> in their inner ear that are leaving their home and they're free floating in their canal and this is causing their eyes to have nystagmus and their room is spinning. I mean, it. if you don't know anything about vestibular function or anatomy, it sounds a little crazy, right? But then you get this yeah. model where you can actually see how the otoconia are moving with different positions. And I think that's really helpful, not only for a learning clinician, but also educating patients and even then patients educating family members and employers and whoever else. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, I find a lot of people, once they have something like it's real, once it ends up in their hand. So, um, you know, Helena will tell me a lot of times where she gains patient buy-in and confidence by showing them like look this is in like this is why i'm this is why i have to hold that position so long like i have to wait for all this to come to the next position and then when you're here i'm gonna have to turn you over again because look they're over they're all the way on the far side of the canal it's like two or three movements until i get you home and once they can actually see it and touch it um it really does drive that home um and actually, I will show you something else that is a model that I developed. So this is the 2D ball maze. Um, so Helena will um, tell me, or she told me frequently about how she would use the anatomy of a ball maze to patients. Like, she's like, oh, you know how you, you're in a doctor's office and you gotta, you gotta move the balls around to get it in the middle. So I was like, oh, like I can design a 2D ball. Like I just basically took my solid model I could look down on it like this, kind of from the top view, trace the outlines, and that ends up being this. Um, I put green in the middle because that's where we all we all want them. We want the crystals to be back in the middle where the green is, and I even put like little uh, little divots where the cupula was to simulate cupulothiasis on both sides. Um, I even built in a posterior to horizontal conversion. So if you try and get out of the posterior canal, you have a 50-50 chance to hit it right there. It'll either go into the horizontal canal or back into the vestibule. Um, this is this is my little pet project, although <laughs> very few people have ever bought it, and that's totally fine. Like it was again mainly for me as a way to understand it more. Um, well, that's going to go on my uh, on baby Isley's Christmas list. That's going to be her, <laughs> one of her little toys that she's going to be getting for Christmas because it makes sound, but also she, we got to teach her young. The, my daughter loves it. She was she she thought that the idea was to get the balls in all the divots. She's like, look, I got them all on the divots. I'm like, oh, well, this person now has mega cupolithiasis. <laughs> this person is now not moving because yeah. their symptoms are very strong. They are spinning in all the directions at the same time. Um, the one thing I also want to point out, this model, as well as the fluid and the solid, they're actually all available on our website for free to build. So we we actually have the complete step-by-step -step instructions on almost all of our models. And we provide it with a Creative Commons license. It's a non-commercial um, Creative Commons license, but you can actually just literally download the model, have a library print it, or you have a friend who has one. Mm -hmm. We have a complete shopping list, all the tubes you have to buy, the crystals to buy. Um, we, I don't believe that education should be behind a paywall. And I felt that this, especially the fluid model, was important enough 
to kind of elevate the industry and elevate the the education of patients and clinicians that I was like, you know what? Like I want everybody to have one of these and it's not for money. It's like, cause I just know it'll make the world a better place. And I'll, I'll say I, I've built one. I went through all of your instructions and I had one printed and I went through your shopping list and I'll say, it's a very easy to follow, great thing to put together. You learn a lot from putting it together yourself. Um, so I, I will say it's actually really great. And that if you have um, the uh, passion to do something like that, you should definitely check that out, download everything and give it a try because it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we had, I think it was University of Kansas. Um, they had their entire graduating class do them. So they had the library. They had a grant from the library. They printed out like 50 or 60 of them. And they actually, they had a whole production line. And interestingly enough, we actually pulled, uh, we found a, a, a better production technique from watching their video and photos. They, they used a hairdryer to loosen up before they push the, the final tube in. Oh, that's so smart. And so we actually use that in our own production. We're like, oh, look, like that made it really easy to like get the tube in at the end. So we integrate that into our own process, which is just wonderful. I'll say that if anybody's wondering where you can find a 3D printer, I've had success um, contacting community colleges or like local universities because a lot of them will have 3D print uh, printers on campus and sometimes have programs where they allow people to come in and for a fee print with them. Yep. Um, there's also uh, handy websites um, like 3D hubs where you can find someone near you to help you print something out. So there's a lot of resources out there where you can get something like that printed. But there, I'm sure there's also a lot of people who just like purchasing a fully put together, ready to go model as well. <laughs> and, and we're happy to do that as well. I just the, the education piece is very important to me. Um, and it's something where, again, I want I don't want, you know, the lack of money to stop someone who's very enterprising. Uh, if they have the time and they can build on their own, like that's wonderful. And then that's one more model uh, out there. So and I, I'll say that I've seen a lot of different variations of things that people have put together. I know Jeff Walter had a uh, clinician put together a model using casting uh, splints. I think it was an OT that was using splints and dipping them in a hydrocolator and, and creating something to show, you know, patients in the clinic. Um, I've seen other people throw together different types of materials. Um, but again, you know, it's difficult to have that knowledge of anat like a correct anatomical positioning, um, all those little fine aspects that you wouldn't think about uh, that you guys have really put together in your models, which I just absolutely love. Love, love, love. Thank you. I, I do what the, the, I'll, I will finish up the fluid model by bringing out this is kind <laughs> of the the Cadillac of uh, training models is essentially what you had just said was on the edge, like training clinicians to walk through positions or repositioning maneuvers is complicated. I, I know that because I'm looking at it from the outside going like, how do you remember every angle and every, oh, the, and now they switch to the side and uh, what, how is it actually affecting uh, the canals? So, so what describe, we did is, what, describe what you're holding. Oh, sure. So what I have here is essentially a headband that's an adjustable headband and it goes around your head and on either side of it, kind of where your ear is, there is two very smaller, like three or four inch fluid models and they're mirrored we have a right and a left. Um, and it also has a, an adjustable, um, it's called a ball joint. So essentially what you have is you can put it on somebody on a student. Let's say you're training students. You put this you know, on their head, you tighten it down. You, there's a bubble level at the top. So, you know, exactly. Let me see if I can get it in the frame here. There's a little tiny bubble level right here. So essentially you put it on your head, try and do this live. And then once you get it in position, which I'm, I'd have to have someone else actually like look at it with me. <laughs> you can position the canals exactly kind of, let me see if I can do it through the camera here, kind of. There you go. Close. Yeah, ish. And I'm also <laughs> reversed, so it's all like backwards to me. Um, and you lock it down. And then when you essentially, when you do the position, these also have little crystals in it. Um, and to me, this actually hit home the most because the first time I saw Helena do um, an Epley on somebody, like it was a, it was a, 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 a an employee, but someone he's like, "Here, let's show me an Epley with this." I just traced, 
I was like, all right, we're going to start with crystals here. And at every position changed, I, I looked at that canal and I was like, oh, like, that's why you have to get on all four. Like, that's why you have to go down here. That's why you have to do your head this way. And you could actually see the connect, the crystals move as they relate to the head motion right back into the vestibule. Um, and that's something that, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like, you certainly know that theoretically you have that kind of um, academic knowledge about how it all works. But then when you have someone with this on their head... <laughs> And you're watching them go through these maneuvers. You're like, like, oh, that makes a lot more sense now. Um, and in some ways, this was also the the headband was inspired a little bit by John Epley's story. Um, he built one out of buckets and tubes um, as a way to sh as a way to build out um, the movements of his, his like named uh, Epley, but also other maneuvers. Like, uh, and I was like, all right, well, A, I'm not going to use buckets. Like, we can get, we're a little bit, we have more technology now than the 70s. Um, but I really wanted a, a teacher-friendly version that would let you literally step through ma the maneuvers um, and watch the crystals. Um, and I would be even, I'd be honored indefinitely if someone found a new technique using this like if they were to look at the crystals with crystals in the right can like all right how do we get them a patient with this kind of mobility issues like because then they can they can see it it's on a head they get mm -hmm. like well how do i need to move the head and how can i get the rest of the body to get in that position um it definitely opens up the it makes it easier for someone to very easily uh, visualize um whether or not a technique is going to work even before even before you touch a patient Sure. I definitely see that happening at some point in the future where someone uses one of these fluid models, the what perhaps the one with the two models on the headband and figures out some maybe it will be Danny and I. Who knows? <laughs> I would love that. Like I would I would just be uh, uh I'd be honored, honestly, just to be able to be be a part of what I feel is a very important industry. Um yeah. and something That's that really cool. you know, Vertigo is something that I have a lot of friends and family around me that have it. And it's even though it won't kill you day one, like it's debilitating. Like it messes up your, it messes up the rest of your day. You have fall risk issues. Like it's something that is definitely, um, I, I wish they would take the benign out of the word BPVV because even though, yes, it is officially benign medically, like, socially and like being able to get back to your life it's not at all like it's it's quite debilitating well one thing i like about the models is that it takes the scariness and the abstractness out of learning how to treat patients with vestibular dysfunction i found that if you have something to look at that makes sense to you that you can visualize get your hands on it might make you more willing to approach the vestibular specialty and treat patients with vertigo. I feel like our our um, com our vestibular community, though small, is growing. And I think that's because there's so much more resources and educational material available to people and um, physical therapists where it's not as scary to learn anymore. You know, before, if you had no vestibular background, you'd see a dizzy patient on your schedule and have a little mini panic attack. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I feel like having something like this really uh, might help expand the field and make people feel more comfortable with specializing in treating patients with vestibular dysfunction, which is ultimately what we want. We want more clinicians out there to be competent and feel comfortable treating this patient population because it is so common. And it's something that people really struggle with finding a good clinician to help treat them for. So I yeah. think that it's a huge Agreed. addition to the field to have something like this, where you take this concept and you make it so much more relatable, learnable, and visible. So tangible, tangible. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it's huge. It's a, it's a really big feat um, with, that you guys are, have done. It's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. It's, <laughs> I, I have really enjoyed it. Um, and it's something that as, as we get feedback from our customers and um, just the industry in general, like even at like a, a trade show, we'll have a group of students walk up and they're like, why didn't I have this 
in my <laughs> like I would have I would have passed my vestibular mm -hmm. section if I had just understood this a little bit more, or, you know, like um, just to see their excitement. Like once they recognize it, like oh, like that's the vestibular canals. Like oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, just, it's, it's great. I love to see that. Well, I remember walking up to your guys' booth at CSM in 2019. And around this time, I was just trying to also figure out the idea of some fluid-filled model, mostly because people had been you know, emailing, do you have anything fluid-filled? Do you have anything that shows the canals? And I didn't. I had no idea what I was doing. And I walked up to your booth. I said, that's it. Like, that is literally everything you need and that's perfect that's amazing which i was very thankful that you guys figured out because i did not want to spend any more time and money figuring that one out <laughs> it was hard <laughs> no yeah um, i would say it was 75 percent my journey of trying to understand um more clearly um and i would say i would also say approach it from a beginner's mindset like i have in some ways and every day this lessons but um, I have the beginner's mindset. I'm not a clinician. I was not exposed to a lot of images, good or bad. Um, and I knew there was there was some features there that I hear a lot of, but I never saw visualized well or never saw like that had that kind of tactile feel. Mm -hmm. So that's really, uh, in some ways, I think helped the product um, because I wasn't I wasn't biased from you know expecting <laughs> expecting this being the standard you know expecting the the pipe cleaner model to be the standard i was able to kind of dream big and then and then figure out how to make it so patrick bring us up to speed to today with your partnership with vestibular today and the model that you've produced together there and then also we'll want to know where to find these sure absolutely all right, so let's see. I, my whole desk, if you could see it, is like filled with models right now, which is so much fun. Um, all right, so I mean, we Danielle and I met um, in 2018 when she was doing, I think it was at the International Vestibular Conference. You had kind of like branded versions of your mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, I was very like, I'm very transparent with everyone in the industry. like introduce myself you know this is kind of where we're what we're doing at that point we did not have the fluid model um but i was always you know we were, i was checking out her site and obviously her website and the youtube all the different um you know resources sh she was putting out and just over the years we've we've always just kept in contact and sending funny things to each other on facebook or you know what have you and then um as we started talking more i i think that and Danny, correct me if I'm wrong. Like I, I went to your site one day and didn't find your models. I was like, yeah. like, oh, I was. We had someone ask us, like, oh, do you sell the functional inner ear model? I'm like, mm -hmm. no. And I was like, here, here's where you go. And I was like, oh, I don't know where to send you because they are gone. Yeah, um, I mean, and it got to the point where. So vestibular today was just something that I put together to collect all the resources that I was putting together as I was coming up in the specialty, right? So any study I, I found or case study that I was doing, I was just trying to put on a single a single website for other people to utilize and, and learn from. And then we came up with a model um, when I was going on a con ed course with my, my um, clinic. And then from there, people asked where they could get it. So I just wanted an easy printable model for people to be able to afford out in the in the field. And it it grew. I mean, like you said, the international conference, they asked me to create a model for each of the key speakers. So I, I shipped 22 models out for that conference. Um, the Emory course, uh, you know, uh, for the vestibular competency, they wanted a, a model for every clinician or for every clinician that was teaching in the faculty there. So that worked out great, which kind of grew and grew and grew. But it got to the point where it was just expensive and time consuming for me to resource out to these other uh, 3D printing companies. And I had to sit and uh, hand sand every 3D model and put together all the rings on them. And I was driving to community colleges to save on shipping to try to keep the cost out as much as possible. It was getting to be a lot. Um, and I had a big move to uh, the South and that kind of interrupted my, ch my uh, supply chains. So at that point I was like, I I can't do this anymore. You guys were doing a great job with your fluid filled model and the, and the, um, the options that you guys had. I was like, I could just step back now and I can, I can be done with this, but you're right. People kept uh, contacting and asking where they could 
get this. And then it just so happened with perfect timing that you, me and Helena sat down, we started talking and you're like, wait a minute, we could potentially help out and, and take this over too. So I am extremely, extremely excited about this because your guys' knowledge and expertise and ability to go through and take something and make it better. It just, it just blew this thing up. I mean, I am so excited for what you guys have done to this model. It looks 10 times better than anything that I was putting together. So uh, why don't you explain a little bit about the changes that you made and what people can now um, see when they go to purchase this functional inner ear sure. model? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I will say that uh, you, you should give yourself a little bit of credit there that the model, the, the underlying model itself, I did not change. Um, the, the core model that you built, um, other than um, taking it from like, I think it had 2 million faces <laughs> down to like 170,000 faces, which is fine for this size. Um, that was all I did. Like I just basically simplified the geometry just to make it easier to upload and to work with in, in, the, in my software. But the underlying uh, shape has not changed. Um, what we did do is, uh, so we, we, at this point, we did have a lot of experience with kind of the feedback from the field of what people wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So being able to know what canal is what is, was very important. Um, being able to clearly identify where the cupola side was, was also very important in the data. Um, and a data point that you actually gave us uh, was that people wanted to stand. They wanted to, they wanted to, they wanted to stand on something the way that a traditional um, anatomical model would in another office. Um, so I will show you this where we're at now. I'll show you the single model. So what I have here, this is actually the new vestibular today model. Um, it is, it comes on a metal. This is actually our 3D printed base, which will be the default base. We also have a wood base, which I'll show you with the, the match pair. It comes off. So this can just kind of stand on your desk and then you can hand it to your patient and say, here, like, get your hands on this. And this is what I'm going to do. Um, we also found, so the rings were, I know that that was a very important part of the functional side of the functional inner ear, but I, I, I wasn't happy with a, the labor of getting it on and off. Yeah. We had, we had feet, we had people that um, gave us feedback that said, well, sometimes I don't, I don't want it on all three canals. Like mm -hmm. I just want to show posterior canal because that's where the person has the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, anterior canal is very, it's rare. It happens, but it's not, it, it doesn't, it's not so much that it needs its own ring all the time. Um, so that's where I look, you know, we, this is kind of where we go and say, all right, well, what is, what's a ring that's removable that looks nice. That's the right size. And in this case, off the shelf is almost always less expensive. So we actually found, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. It's a, it's a little, it's a nose ring. <laughs> Just genius. I mean, I, I it's, found little 10 millimeter, um, jewelry rings that I had to, bend apart and bend back on and they weren't removable right. like the bigger models I had that use binder clips. Right. So, so nose ring it genius. snaps right on and off. It's visually like it's a, it's a seamless, like you don't see any um, outside edges. Um, and then you get the idea, the idea of your model kind of like our crystals is to simulate what happens when you move and you can kind of see that ring using gravity, which is like, you know, again, a perfect um, connection there. Uh, through space. So we kept the ring. We're, they are going to only ship with one ring um, for each side and the, with the intention that you would move it to the canal that mm -hmm. you are demonstrating to the customer or to the patient. Um, the other thing that we also learned, so, and this is, uh, this uh, we did not get from feedback, but I got when I said, hey, Danielle, can you send me what are, what are all the numbers mean? Yeah. You, oh, cause that's right. I had mine. So if I don't, you probably can't see mine up here, but I had little numbers on all the canals. Cause I had a little graphic card that I would send out that labeled each thing and described what each thing was, but that's great. As long as you have the graphic card, if you don't have that. Here, you know, <laughs> so when I said, Hey, Hey, Danielle, can you send me that card? You're like, Oh, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you know what? Other people were going to lose that too. Yeah. Um, so we switched to letters. So we have A, H, and P for anterior, horizontal, and posterior. 
And then actually Sue Whitney um, recommended that we had a, we have something that denoted the cupula. So we we have a little asterisk on the cupula side of each canal. We have, whether it's right or left, so there's a little R engraved, this is the right ear. We also have at the top, which is going to be hard to see, but we'll, we'll put some photos up. There's actually a directional arrow embedded in the top. So the intention is for you as a clinician, okay, this is my right ear. I just point that arrow forward, and now my now the model is in the correct position. That's so so I don't need to worry about, well, did I get this right? Like, no, as long as that arrow is facing forward, I can hold it next to my ear at the correct orient orientation. I love it. Again, there's just so many little nuances that make it so great and a great patient education and clinician tool because it helps with anatomy. It helps with positioning. It helps with just showing a patient how things are supposed to move and how the maneuvers are going to help. Like, it's amazing. I am I am so grateful to you and Helena for partnering on this and just elevating this product. The stand alone is amazing. Um, well, I mean, really cool. Uh, oh, and the stand also has you know, the vestibular today logo at the base as well. <laughs> Much so appreciated. It looks, it looks very nice. And on the, just so you know, as on the bottom, and again, I'm happy to put this up, there's a complete legend. Oh. So it shows you, it has everything labeled just in case the A, P and H and the arrow don't make sense. There's also a QR code, so you can scan that, and it'll take you right to uh, kind of a how-to for that uh, for that product. So you get there'll be a video, um, another kind of explanation, maybe an FAQ, so um, cool. just as another way for people to say, "Oh, well, what is this, and how do I use it?" So excited! All right, Patrick, this oh. is my last question for you. Sure. Oh, can Where I share one more I thing? Find a vestibuloholic <laughs> husband. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, hang out at Wharton or any engineering <laughs> school. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's a great a far and few between. I also just want to point out that there is a true to size model, which I love using with my patients. It's kind of fun to show them. And I'm hmm. putting it up to the screen now if you're looking on uh, YouTube. It's kind of fun to show them how small but mighty the vestibular apparatus is. It's only about the size of a dime. So you don't imagine that something that tiny controls so much of your everyday life. I'm, I'm wearing my true size models on, my, on each ear. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys are also printing the true to size, but you've like glitzed them up significantly. They are beautiful. So uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the only real, the only thing that we did differently is that it, in the cochlea, we actually embedded the L and the R. We oh. carved out L and R, which you will definitely not be able to see. I have this here. Um, we'll have, we'll, I'll send you some photos or we can put some photos in an overlay. Sure. Um, mainly to, again, it's, this is an educational model. Um, we did actually do this to make it helpful for people to be able to quickly identify the right versus the left. Um, and then we're doing these in gold, rose gold, and silver. So um, just we're doing those models will be all metal. The, the plastic ones, we were we were concerned at the structural stability of them and getting crushed or you know getting lost, honestly. Um, so the metal is a little heavier and uh, the uh, the precious metal hopefully will have people more, uh, it'll, it'll catch their eye a little bit more. They won't lose it as much. And they won't get crushed or lost or Correct. anything like that. So I, I really like that. Now you also have a stand for both models. Is that right too? Oh, I did. Yeah, I meant to show that with the first section. So we also sell a matched pair. We put together a matched pair. So it's on one base. Oops, get the camera right. So it's on one base and it's two models. And then the idea, again, it's the, each model is removable. It has the legend on the bottom. Um, and this is actually showing the wood base. So we have a, it's like a dark maple. We, have, we found a local uh, carpenter who's retired and he's like, I'll knock these out for you, no problem. Um, so we have some of the wooden bases. It's really, the, functionally they're the same, just whether you want uh, a wood or a, you know, kind of a gray 3D printed one. Now, can people so, download the information for those models as well and print at home? Not yet. So I want to make sure the problem. So the issue with this model, 
um, as as you know, Danielle, is that the three D the three D printers that you have access to at home um, are very good don't get me wrong but the level of detail they have access to is not as good as the the printers that we're going to be using so my main concern with releasing those is that people print them and then be unhappy with how they turned out because the letters aren't going to show up real well it's it's going to be a little bit the details not going to be as clean um yeah unless it's so, real unless it's real big it's actually very hard to correct. print in that plastic like we the um bigger models that we print on uh that i printed on sure. are huge but they don't clean up as nice yeah correct. they're they're a lot more rough the detail is very difficult and they take forever i think these prints yeah. take like 12 hours um, so that was definitely a problem. Um, so I, I do ag agree that the finer, smaller prints are uh, yeah. a lot nicer to, to work with. I, I would be open to spending some time to design something for a home 3d printer. Um, but we'd have to design it in such a way that like, I want people to be able to reliably make it. And mm -hmm. when they make it for it to reflect the time and energy we put into the model. So I don't want everyone being frustrated and saying like, oh, this looks nothing like the one you have on your site. Like um, I want, that's why the fluid model works well is that very little supports. It's like prints really reliably. Um, we've had only, the only trouble people report is not getting air in the tubes. Mm -hmm. So that was from, from the model itself has been very reliable to print. And when we have done, when we were doing prototypes of this in house, they were rough. They were, they were, they were very, you really had to like squint your eyes to see the, you know, the, the, the ugly baby or through the, the beauty through the ugly baby as mm -hmm. of the 3d print. Um, but yeah, I would say one day we might be able to do find a way to make that accessible for sure. But moral of the story is if you can support small business and Patrick, where can we find these models online to purchase? Yeah, so they are all available on our website, which is just vestibularfirst.com. And you, we have a store page. And we also, if you want to find instructions on how to make your own, you would just click on the education page. And then they have all the models that we mentioned um, that had tutorials. They're all right up on the website. We'll be sure to put everything in the show notes um, that we talked about today. Uh, at vestibular.today, uh, I'll also be putting together, putting back my store up to be forwarded to you guys, um, just because I think that uh, what you guys have created and what you have available is just unmatched. It's just absolutely amazing. And we are so grateful that you have taken the time over these years to really hone in on these awesome uh, models. I think that they're great for patient education, clinician education, and it's definitely making our community that much better having that available. So thank you for everything that you've done. Oh, you're uh, very welcome. Polina, I mean, Vestibular First in itself is just amazing with making goggles affordable to everybody and the resources that you guys put together are just fantastic. So we're really, really excited to be working with you and we love, love, love talking about you guys. Oh, well, thank you. Making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us. And as always, thank you to our listeners. We'll see you soon. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos, blogs, continuing education classes, and resources, including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBV treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.